thank you. It, it indeed is a pleasure to be here. And Claire, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back in London, um, a place that uh, many years ago I spent almost a year as a student when I was studying music, not medicine, before I went to medical school. Uh, and I uh, have very, very fond memories of all the little nooks and crannies in and around London. Um, I, I'd like to today talk about genetic susceptibility primarily, and it has been a very exciting time, and I think some of the excitement has come with good healthy competition, as Claire alluded to, and then collaboration. I think the best thing you can do in this world, I think, that we've learned from at least this, the side of genetic susceptibility that still I think the somatic uh, sequencers have yet to truly embrace, which is the sharing and the collaborative nature of the data. And I'll come back to that towards the end of my talk. But I also just wanted to first say to everyone, happy Groundhog Day. Now, I know I'm in the UK. Guy Fox Day is very special here. In the US, almost no one knows what it's about. Who knows what Groundhog Day is here besides the Bill Murray movie, which is a great movie. It's a very important time in which you take stock of what the winter looks like. Puxatawney Phil, which is photographed here, comes up in this tiny little town in Pennsylvania, and all of America stops to see whether he sees his shadow or not. And that tells us whether there's a lot more or less winter to come. And there was a little bit of a shadow, but not much of a one, which is good, considering when I left for Europe 10 days ago, there was 30 inches of snow on the ground, and Washington, DC was completely shut down. But we always say to each other today, happy Groundhog Day. And so I thought I would greet you all with a happy Groundhog Day. But on a more serious note, let's just stop for a minute and think about the etiology of cancer. Dahl and Pito, back in the early 80s, had published their seminal study trying to really disentangle the different causes of cancer. And we clearly have learned a tremendous amount from the epidemiologic literature looking at environmental and viral and pollutants and modifiable lifestyle activities, but it's really only of recent that genetic susceptibility has really come alive. We tried this in the 80s and 90s, but in a very, very poor way where we thought we were smart enough to choose a given SNP or variant and apply it, and just about everything we did in that, some 10 to 12,000 papers in PubMed, maybe five or six of them have turned out to be real. When you really get down to it and look at it beyond the family structure, and I think that it, 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 there's an important lesson here in that, as you'll see, I'm much more of a frequentist than a Bayesian when it comes to looking at genetics. And I think the agnostic statistics are very important. You always have to pay close attention to them. And there's a certain space where we will be challenged with that, and next generation sequencing will be that space for certain kinds of variants. And I'll spend a little bit of my talk on that. But when we think about the etiology of cancer, um, the man who was in the position that I'm uh, fortunate enough to be in for 30 years, Joe Fromani, a real great legend in cancer epidemiology, always said that really we had to think of cancer etiology as 100% genetic and 100% environmental, i.e. the genetic is what sets your carburetor or your body situation in, in response to how you would metabolize smoke or changes in BMI or certain kinds of environmental exposures. And it's really, we have to understand what that interface really looks like if we're really going to intercede and prevent cancer. So for years, we've had very elegant environmental and, and um, epidemiologic studies. And since really the development of a map of the genome and then the subsequent annotation, which was really an international effort, and it wasn't an American effort alone, although it's often representative that critical things happened here in the UK, just as critical as in the United States. And I always feel it's important to recognize that because there can be a little bit of Americanism, uh, you know, we can get a, uh, a little beyond our, our britches, so to speak. But I think that when we look at what that genome has given us, it's now given us the opportunity to look at variation in all of these different spaces, from rare mutations to single nucleotide polymorphisms to chromosomal structures and the like, and then this world of epigenetics, to try and better understand what the etiology of cancer is. And then there's the recent Tomasetti and Vogelstein argument that it's chance, the stochastic op, you know, op opportunity for stem cells to go awry, an interesting hypothesis highly flawed in many ways, didn't take into account the environmental and 
and geographic differences that we see in some cancers as much as 10 to 12 fold when you go from one part of the world to the next. So the assumptions for the precise uh, estimates they had, I think, are faulty, but the idea is still a very arresting and an important one that I think we have to keep uh, in stock of, and I'll come back to that in the third part of my talk. So really, today I'm going to primarily talk about one of the four cancer spaces, okay? I like to think of first dividing the germline and the somatic, germline, i.e. what you're born with. We like to consider it stable, but I'm going to show you a lot of information that unfortunately as we age, our genomes are falling apart, and this is really a very scary thing, and next generation sequencing is showing this in spades, all right? And the somatic is that of the genome of the cancer that takes on its own life that um, I don't like to use the word evolve, I think devolves, because I don't see cancer as an advantageous activity per se, but uh, nonetheless, I think uh, many of the academics continue to talk about its evolution. And we know that there's sort of this very interesting divide that's kind of murky, and I know Genome England is really, Genomics England is really at that cutting edge of what is discovery, what do we understand, and what do we think is important versus what is really actionable, what becomes clinically relevant. And that space is very blurred, particularly in next generation sequencing. And cancer has taught us a lot, but cardiovascular, diabetes, you know, neuropsychiatric, all these other disciplines are struggling with this same question. And, the, and so today I want to sort of make the case that the acceleration of the discovery aspect of germline is still going at full tilt and can deliver things that I think are both public health and potentially personal value, okay? In the same way next generation sequencing is, is very quickly coming up, uh, upon that. The clinically actionable gets to be very complex because you have you various spaces. So if we think about what do we know right now, we know about 115 to 120 different genes are important for susceptibility to cancer in families, rare mutations, that if you see them or they are described in, with a certain ascertainment bias, it's important for the risk for that particular cancer. There are about 25 moderately penetrant, and there are now over 530 independent GWAS loci, and we'll talk about those a little bit more. We know that the somatic is getting these great snapshots. I like to consider them as sort of forensic Polaroids of cancer where they take a bit of a tumor and you take a photograph like on NCIS or Law and Order, all the television shows that are very popular, and then you work forwards and backwards from there. And there are extraordinary things that are coming out of that with what are drivers and what are passengers, what, it, what is heterogeneity, things that Charlie Swanton and others have really been at the cutting edge in telling us that to think of cancer as a purely clonal aberration is a very dangerous view, particularly when it comes to, I think, treatment and metastases. And then, of course, we have our favorite actionable things that in the United States, we have the American College of Medical Genetics, which sort of uh, somewhere in the 16th or 17th century with respect to having sort of Byzantine rules for how you do things and you have to put your cap on and meet a certain number of times and spend hours and bill a certain way, something that has to change, and I'll come to that a little bit later, but it's, it's, what, it's where we're coming from. And, I, and I, my understanding is a little bit more plastic here in the UK, but not as plastic as it probably needs to be, and I think the science is going to drive that. And then we have targeted therapy, you know, the great excitement of cancer. You know, I'm unfortunately old enough to have lived through the excitement of early chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and then on to targeted therapy. Now we're already in a new age of immunotherapy. But each of these are very profound and important approaches, but are not uniquely going to solve all the problems of cancer. And so. It's that complexity that we see emerging. And then what do you test? A single mutation, single gene, panels of cancer genes. In the United States, you go to 16 centers, and you have 16 different panels that have about 75% overlap. And then everyone else is sort of favorite little corners. So the rather sort of aleatoric nature of how we discover things is a bit of a uh, disadvantage. And then, of course, as the prices go down, exome and whole genome just look very, very appealing. So for today, I wanted to sort of talk about four questions. The defining of the underlying architecture of genetic susceptibility, and how, how can we use what we currently know, and where are we going with this? The second is the challenge of next generation sequencing, 
and how far can we go with observational data, okay? <coughs> Where we see something and we have bioinformatic <coughs> information, and bioinformatics is sort of like the Wizard of Oz, a big box with a lot of curtains and a lot of smoke coming out of it, and occasionally is very important, but you have to do the work, you, you know, you gotta walk the yellow brick road, and I may be offending some, but I think we all, we, I think most people know what I'm talking about, okay? And then the constancy of the germline, and how much does it change with age? This is a scary thing. And then towards stronger evidence for these above questions. I'll come back to data sharing in large structures, things that are going on in the NIH, NCI, and I'm sure you've been reading about uh, our Vice President Joe Biden and the, the moonshot. Not what I would use as the, as the most logical metaphor for this, but nonetheless one that we're curious to see whether this will be an unfunded mandate or will actually be a funded mandate, and that's something that's playing out before our very eyes. So defining the underlying architecture of genetic susceptibility, already you can see that it's complex, and that's why I had the title to begin with, that when you go to a given cancer, you can see that there are many different ways and many different potential contributing factors, but none of them are necessary nor sufficient in and of themselves. So we know that there's been evidence for heritability for cancer. You go back to the mid-1800s, 1866, the great French neurobiologist, Paul Le Broca, described, and it's a very prescient paper before we really had the term genetics, his own family, where his wife, daughters, nieces, aunts, all developed breast cancer. They clearly had a BRCA mutation, but um, his bones are not accessible. I, know, I have a very dear French colleague who had approached wanting to put this to rest and say, gee, does the Broca family have a BRCA mutation? And too many generations down, they couldn't get it you know, to the point where they wanted to. So no one has confirmed that, but it sure looks like an Ashkenazi-like mutation, you know, highly penetrating in that city. And then we had lots of twin and family and sibling studies, which went for about 100 years. And then, actually, Joe Frameni made a very important observation with Fred Lee that cancers could cluster in families, but they didn't have to be the same cancer. So that tells us that there's more to one gene and one outcome in cancer, that there are other factors, whether it's environmental, genetic modifiers, or specific mutations may have different proclivities. And uh, that's been, a, I think, a very important observation. Around that time, Al Knudsen made the ever important observation of the two-hit hypothesis for a disease like retinoblastoma, where you could have an inborn error in one of your two alleles of the retinoblastoma gene, which put you at much greater risk for those spontaneous mutations that were taking place in the retina of young children. And that second mutation, that second knockout of this type of a gene was very important for developing um, retinoblastoma. And then in 91, Mary Claire King won the race to at least map what we now know to be a familial breast cancer gene, BRCA1, by 1994. We're off to the races on, on that one. So if we look at breast cancer, we can see that it really does have a complex uh, underlying genetic architecture. So if you look here on the bottom with frequencies, genome-wide association studies have found a whole series of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism that are in redundant key biologic pathways. No single one is either required or sufficient nor necessary. And then we have BRCA mutations at lower frequencies, and then some very rare ones out here. And as you can sort of see, there is a selective sweep here. You, you don't have a lot of high, highly effective, you know, uh, strong mutations that are in populations, at least in the large general population of whether it's the UK or the US, uh, where there's been a certain amount of admixture and enough uh, mixing of the population per se. So this is sort of our model for how we've sort of looked at trying to identify how each of these spaces are going to be understood. And so it's taking genome-wide association studies here, uh, and then into sequencing into families and population studies to begin to sort of get the handle on how we put together what we think is that comprehensive set of variants. So for the 115 gene, genes that are mutated, it's a shotgun across the genome. There is no HLA equivalent for cancer that we know for infectious disease and autoimmunity, that there's a particular spot that has evolved and has tremendous heterogeneity, and most importantly, variability that's important for risk of cancer. Now, HLA can be important in some of the cancers that are driven by viruses. 
such as, you know, we know Burkitt's lymphoma, some of the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and the like have very impressive HLA signals. But when we think of the highly penetrant mutations that are rare, that there's a high likelihood that when seen passed from generation to generation that a cancer can develop, then, then we really don't see that. The challenge here is that as we look at something like Genomics England, where you're going to talk about sequencing across the population, these have been ascertained in families. These are rare mutations with strong effects. But we really don't know what the mutational profile looks like at the population level. We have some inkling with some studies, but it's not completely clear. And so already we've seen in some of our cardiovascular and non-cancer cohorts in the United States where sequencing is going on, you can see such things as the BRCA, some of the BRCA mutations that are awfully scary, or you can see the cystic fibrosis mutation, the Delta 508 in a 60-year-old gentleman who has no pulmonary disease. So the notion that a mutation means that you're going to necessarily get that disease is one that we have to be very careful. The risk is clearly there, but the, the necessary follow-through is something that's a more uh, complex problem. And in almost all of these, we now, as we see like with BRCA, that there's incomplete penetrance. You can have that mutation and not necessarily develop that disease. And we've seen such um, consortia such as Simba be able to show us that they're genetic and environmental modifiers thereof. And I think we'll see that in many of these. We also have seen out of the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, the Knudsen hypothesis in a slightly modified way in which you can see a high fraction of the women with ovarian cancer have BRCA mutations, 10 to 15 percent in the TCGA, and another 20 to 25 percent of the women who don't have BRCA mutations indeed have very important events, either epigenetic silencing of BRCA1 and 2 or have a mutation that either turns it off or, or truncates it or, in fact, deletes it. So, you know, the, the, the question of whether you have to knock out necessarily both alleles is very much on the table when we start looking at adult cancers. But that concept is a very important one to look at, particularly when you're talking about tumor suppressor genes and asking the question, what is it that's failing to, to work properly? Do you have to lose both copies, or can you lose one and be at a disadvantage and other events take place that would supersede the loss or the need for that loss of that second one? Now, Naz Rahman had published in, oh, now two years ago, a really beautiful, elegant piece in uh, Nature looking at these. And one of the things that she had noted is at that time, and the number is actually even higher, that about 50% of those 115 genes were known mutation, had known mutations in somatic cancers that had been described in cosmic, ICGC, TCGA. So, in other words, these are the kinds of drivers that, that the frequentists who are sequencing like mad large numbers of cancers are trying to identify on the basis of saying the recurrence is clearly a very important event in development of ovarian cancer, breast cancer, or testicular cancer, or whatever. So, you know, it, it's interesting. This number is creeping up. This is a little bit of an old slide. I think now, just recently looking, it's about 65 percent of those genes do you see very deleterious mutations in one or more described cancers that are at a frequency that are high enough to get beyond that unique observation in cosmic where you just don't know what to do with one or two mutations in a particular gene per se. Um, but only a fraction in the United States, only 26 of these meet the medieval criteria of the American College of Medical Genetics. So, you know, in this day and age, those who run medical genetics clinics in cancer have, you know, literally 80 percent, they don't have a formal recommendation of what to say. So you're really in that position of doing your best and saying our current knowledge is such and such we are worried about. We think that there is a substantial risk for subsequent members of a family and that decisions have to be made along those lines. At the same time, we have to be careful not to transition from one to the next. Now, uh, I imagine you've probably seen a little bit here in the UK, but in the United States we've had a number of, of reports, and particularly from some of my colleagues who are cancer geneticists uh, in particularly high-profile institutions where a woman would have her genome sequenced, find a PALB2 or BARD1 mutation that has maybe a relative or at best an absolute risk of two or two and a half fold increase risk for breast cancer, but is being recommended by their home physician 
to have double mastectomy and or oophorectomy because they're making that dangerous transition saying this is like BRCA1, BRCA2, so we should therefore treat or prevent in that setting. And so it's, this is part of the danger of where and how this information is either being interpreted or in my mind sometimes misinterpreted. So that's on one extreme of the genetic architecture. On the other is the genome-wide association world where we have hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of individuals that we've scanned. And we now have at this time about five, not about, 530 known regions, independent regions that have been identified in different cancers, 29 different cancers. Prostate and breast, because of the sheer volume that can be accumulated in these large international consortium like BCAC that Doug Easton has led and, and the like, have really been able to make tremendous strides. And I think it's really very exciting. And at the same time, other cancers like testicular are sort of our, our best, they're our poster child. They have the highest heritability. Every time we scan another 10 cases, we get a new hit, right, Claire? It's just, it's astounding. But the heritability is different between the different kinds of cancers, okay? And how and in what way we define them, we're still very early in this age of trying to lay down the tracks of what we think are the common variants in that map that I showed before, we'll come back to. What's interesting is virtually none of these track with outcome. So they are not terrific for prognosis. Very few of them, two or three of them maybe have met a criteria for that at least suggesting that when you look at these perturbations of the pathways that these are, because these are usually regulatory events, what's happening is you're looking at things that are important for inciting or the etiology of the cancer, but not necessarily the sustaining and the capacity of the cancer to respond to interventions, whether it's surgery or radiation or chemotherapy, target therapy or immunotherapy. So we really haven't seen the common variants very well established is a clinical outcome, per se. In fact, anyone that says that, I'd be very suspect, because most of the reports have died on the vine of attempted uh, replication. So when we look at these, the difference with the GWAS is we see a marker by using genome-wide association scans, and then we have to dig down deep and ask the question, does correlation suggest or imply causation? Not necessarily. We have to take each one of these and map them specifically to try and understand exactly what we think is going on. Now here, in linkage in GWAS, we have indirect associations. The beauty and also, I think, the daunting challenge of next generation sequencing is you see the variants right there in front of you and how you interpret them. Whether you think they are truly deleterious or not is a very difficult determination. And we have very little evidence for most everything that we see, as ugly as they may look in polyfen or any number of bioinformatic pipelines, the precision of those pipelines is still relatively rough. And so to jump to a clinical decision, in my mind, we have to do under very careful circumstances. So when we've spent a lot of time mapping GWAS hits, we've, you know, uh, as a community, maybe mapped 25 of them or so to really understand what that basic biology, and that's one of the things that's been very interesting is you have the world of geneticists and epidemiologists working together to point towards biology, but they don't, neither of those groups really understand the biology, and it's working with the laboratory scientists to begin to see how and in what way there are certain perturbations that may be druggable, they may be targetable, they may be very revealing with respect to understanding important pathways in cancer. So I'm going to show you here very quickly an example where this is the one only example that I know of in the cancer GWAS that's actually led to a clinical trial that's ongoing right now. So uh, a terrific young woman in our program, Mila Prokonin Olson, took one of the bladder cancer hits, fine mapped it, meaning she looked at all the correlated variants, figured out which ones were most promising uh, by imputation and bioinformatics, did the functional studies to show that the risk allele changed the mRNA expression because it sat right in the promoter, did all of the luciferase, electromobility shift assays, and saw the immunohistochemistry, were able to look at the differences in expression when you pulled out bladder cancer cells, looked at bladder cancer lines that had differences in genotypes. Very elegant work. And it really pointed towards this uh, prostate stem cell antigen. That was the name given to it, but it's actually been more important in pancreatic cancer and liver cancer. And what's interesting was that this SNP really does change the expression of the PSCA. 
for which there was a humanized antibody that was struggling in the world of pancreatic and liver cancer. So when this observation was made, she talked to one of the clinicians in the National Cancer Institute's intramural clinical program, and they got focused on this, and now there's actually an anti-PSC antibody trial, of the humanized antibody going forward right now, specifically looking at bladder cancer, for which this really looks to be far more interesting. There's really no signal for lung or liver or pancreas where it had been tested in early phase one and two studies. So this is a wonderful poster child, but I just want to be very honest. This is a rare example, okay? Most of what we see in GWAS is still in that discovery, scientific, observational excitement, but what it gets translated as a single finding is, is really extremely rare and un unusual. But it's a, you know, it's, it's a place to start. We all need a beachhead. We all need a Normandy to start, right? And so this, is, in our mind, is certainly a place to look at that. So when we started to look at all these GWAS hits, we, a uh, postdoc in my lab, asked this question, the same kind of question that Naz and her team had asked. Could we look at the GWAS signals and ask the question, are there drivers of cancers? Are, are we seeing variation in the genes that we think are somatically important for the cancers themselves? So we looked at the first 263 or so, and we just recently published this, published this in Genome Biology. And unfortunately, when we did this in many different ways, we could not see that there was any increase in the drivers in the genes that were underneath those GWAS peaks compared to 10 different sets of regions chosen across the genome in which there was no GWAS peak. So in other words, this was really telling us that what we're looking at with respect to genome-wide association studies are probably regulatory events that are perturbing and changing pathways that can or cannot respond as well or less well and are part of contributing but neither necessary nor sufficient. We then went a, a step deeper and said, all right, we looked at those genes that we actually knew had a, a functional attribute, these sort of 25. It's now actually up to about 32 or 33 in the literature of those 500, and asked the question, could we look at mutations and do a z-score for mutational load and ask the question, are there still a large subset of the genes that we know of that are important and in, in implicated almost in all cases in a regulatory fashion, and we can't see that. Okay, so the mutational burden as measured in COSMIC and ICGC by a frequentist approach tells us that we're not seeing drivers of cancer per se underneath those GWAS peaks, but rather we're seeing things that are changing important pathways or changing things that are going to be critical for potential risk for that cancer, but not by itself. Like we could do this if we were to take that list of 115 or 120 known cancer predisposition genes and see a high fraction of them, whether you have it somatic or germline, looks to be very important. So as you can see, this architecture of genetic susceptibility sort of has these spaces of up there, the very uh, you know, the damaging drivers that we see in P53 and BRCA1 and the like, the polygenic models of SNPs and SNPs and SNPs, and the perturbations of key pathways. So we then, uh, particularly with Muncie Garcia Closis, who we're very pleased has just come back to join us as our deputy director, she's well known to many, was at ICR for years, started to ask this question, if you looked at sets of SNPs, can we understand things in t that would be of public health value? So we asked this question in bladder cancer. Very well-known cancer has a strong driving factor of tobacco. Forty to fifty percent of the attributable risk of bladder cancer is associated, you know, in the doll and pedo kind of model, is related to tobacco. So what we asked the question is if we could look at the best SNPs that we had that came out of that, could we take this from addressing or estimating the relative risk that we see in our studies and say, all right, at a population level, can we use this in an absolute risk setting? Okay? So we did this thought experiment that if we had 100,000 smokers, sorry, if you can see the display here, sorry, it's hard to turn back there and see how big a difference there is between those individuals who are never smokers versus those who are currently smoking, okay? So we did this thought experiment that if you had 100,000 smokers with high genetic, if you chipped them in or if you did SNPs and just looked at those 12 SNPs, what would happen if you were very effective in eliminating smoking in those individuals over a given period of time? How many cancers would you eliminate? In our U.S. population, you'd eliminate 5,400 bladder cancer. 
But if you did this on the low end of the scheme, you would only be eliminating some 1,500. As you can see, more than almost a fourfold difference in, with respect to the absolute effect of the same measure being applied to a given set of individuals. And this is a, the space that we think we're, we're moving into, which is more sort of precision prevention as focused on uh, profiles of individuals. And I think that this notion of precision prevention, I'll come back to at the very end, where we could see modification based on both genetics and lifestyle potentially decreasing risk. And this is where the common variants may actually be applicable. So with public health genomics, we know prediction is difficult, especially in the future. In the United States, this was supposedly first said by a famous baseball player. I didn't, couldn't find a cricketer who said this, but I'm sure there must have been somebody who held up the ashes who was not very smart who would say something like this, okay? Although I know cricket's a gentleman's sport and they're all well-educated. I've been to Lords, I realize that. But baseball is more of a blue-collar sport. I like baseball more in the United States. And then we had Dan Quayle who said this. You know, not the smartest member to be in the White House in the United States. But it was really Niels Bohr who was very pressing and saying, we have to be really careful about how and in what way we apply our prediction models. So if we were to look at the SNPs and project in 2016, looking at an area under the curve for a rock curve, you could see that the number of variants that we're testing and the number of people that we've discovered in allow us to move this curve to just a certain point. We can't reach that 80%. This is a place where a lot of clinicians, depending on what the trade-off is, you know, what the outcomes are, are a bit uncomfortable to say this would be applicable for an individual choice of what you would say to a person in a room, per se, to do something or not to do something. But it may not be such an unwise thing to think about the population. If you're at the high end or the low end of that, who should be on tamoxifen? Who should have mammography at an earlier or later age? So we've gone a bit deeper in looking at the genetic predisposition to breast cancer. And this is a different one of these maps showing that same sort of sweep here where we now know with you know, the common SNPs uh, that we can explain some 30% of the excess familial risk together with the mutations, we're almost approaching 50% of the excess familial risk. So in a, in a family clinic, this becomes very, very important. We also know that this is important with respect to the age at which we're asking this, because what's the most profound and important risk factor for our common cancers? It's age, all right? So the question is when and where and how do we apply this? So Monsi and uh, Nilanjan Chatterjee started looking at traditional factors that we know have a certain lifetime risk of breast cancer. And then they started to superimpose genetics. And you can see that the curve didn't change that much, but it changed some. And where we're really interested in is where, what do the edges look like here? And if you put them together, the question is, are you able to now identify some 15, 20 percent of the women who are at the highest risk, as I suggested, that you may look at in the bladder cancer paradigm and say, those are the people who should not smoke to be able to eliminate the possible like, you know, risk of developing bladder cancer, per se, at an absolute level. So if we're doing this in breast cancer, we know that they're non-modifiable risk factors, very well established by epidemiologic studies, and we know that they're modifiable ones. But if you start looking at the distribution of these risk factors in the context of the genetics, are we wise to start thinking about the top 10, 20, or 30 percent asking questions of going back here to weight, alcohol consumption, smoking, menopause, hormonal regulation thereof? And when you think of the potential absolute risk estimates that you would see for breast cancer or for prostate cancer, these SNPs are showing something that it's hard to turn your head away and say, at some point should we be testing this? I realize for Genomics England where you have your NGS machines going, there still may be pennies on the pound right now to think about from a public health point of view, do you use SNPs in, in very selected ways? These are questions we have to study. Going back to my very first slide there of those four spaces, I don't mean to jump from discovery to validation, you know, to implementation without a careful thought of how we validate in doing that. But I think the time is clearly ripe to do that. So, you know, this is a question of where you look at this, particularly in women in different risk strata, reaching those thresholds at different ages. So we, in the United States, we struggle over mammography. We may be needing to think about it in a different way with genetics. 
Uh, you know, would this be something that some fraction of women at an earlier age would be more amenable to that kind of analysis? So this really does bring the tension of the utility for individual and public health. Now I realize I may get screamed at in the questions, but until we really sequence some 100 to 200 million individuals, it's going to be really hard to be purely agnostic about this, okay? So how do we address using our current data sets? And this is where uh, I would submit we have to think hard, and we're considering this in the U.S., of using the SNPs in either prostate or breast cancer to look at questions that have been very dirty, PSA testing and mammography, for one, okay? So these are the kinds of things that we're, out, we're trying to formulate as studies to go forward. So let me go to the second question, uh, the challenge of next generation sequencing. As we know, we sort of have this new wild frontier of you just sequence and you see these scary looking mutations in the germline. I'm talking about germline only for right now. And what do you do with that? So here's a study that we didn't publish not so long ago that's really scary. So I'm trained as a pediatric oncologist. We had done the GWAS of osteosarcoma, the most common bone tumor in children. And we said, all right, let's look at P53, which we know something about in terms of a small fraction of having Lee Fraumeni mutations or Rothman-Thompson syndrome. We wanted to know, at a population level, this is coming through all the clinics in the, in the United States, Canada, um, England, actually the UK, there were like 120 patients included in this, as well as in Spain, where they had not come through family, you know, familial cancer type of, of, of screening clinics. And here's what we saw when we did we used you know, the ion torrent, or the proton actually, with targeted sequencing, very high depth. We could see mutations in all of the younger patients, but nobody 30 years and older, which is interesting. There is a literature of osteosarcoma in older individuals with some autoimmune diseases and, and other exposures, per se. And when we looked more closely, we could see that the Lee Fraumeni known mutations, and then those that are rare exonic, that are very scary, but bioinformatically, we have to be very cautious about. But when we looked at this by age, we could see it clearly in the younger patients who were diagnosed somewhere be between ages of 5 and 20, we had a higher fraction of these. So it raises this very uncomfortable question now. What do we do with this? Do we go right into the clinic? Should the pediatric oncology clinics in the United States be doing P53 testing on all kids diagnosed? We propose that, and we're doing that as a research study right now. But again, we're doing this, in, and now a whole exome right now, to be able to ask the question of other mutations we know that are important in, in pediatrics. And already you've probably seen the New England Journal of Medicine paper from St. Jude's where about 10% of the children who were seen at St. Jude's have highly penetrant, what I would consider to be actionable mutations, BRCA1 and 2, P10, some of these other genes that were not necessarily appreciated to be important in the, for the risk of pediatric cancers per se. But this is the kind of question that we really have to study right now. So to do this, we have to work with, with bioinformatics. So the question is, are our genome bioinformatics friends or foe? Well, I think they're very promising. I also think it's very haunting. And in my mind, it's dangerous at the clinical level of moving and saying, I see this, so therefore I am going to act upon this. And this is where the validation is required, and preferably in the laboratory, having model systems and working with collaborators to be able to understand what does this really mean. What it means for us is that there is a lag from the time in which we identify this to how we report it. Do we say we have something of interest, we're going to get back to you in a couple months when we've screened or looked at it in a zebrafish or done a CRISPR or, or you know, any number of things. Those are very expensive models that I reeled off, or there may be in vitro ways of trying to get at this. But this is the kind of question that I think for the clinical implementation, we have to think really hard about how and in what way we line up those laboratory observations that are going to go along with what we see. Unless we were to sequence 200 million individuals, and the frequentists in us would say, oh yes, we can see this, we can follow, and then we can do the more classical you know, uh, segregation analyses, et cetera. We do know that certainly in the United States, and I know this is going on here in the UK, less so, that there's an awful lot of sequencing of tumors without the normal being done. We have this group called Foundation Medicine who legally won't report the germline. 
but you can look at the report, and sometimes you can see between the lines, and sometimes you can't. So this is a, to me, this is really a double-edged, a dangerous position to be in. What do we do with that information? I mean, you know, the higher your coverage, the greater your likelihood of being able to look at allelic fractions and identify, indeed, are there germline mutations that you would want to know about, such as BRCA1, BRCA2, P10, maybe PALB2, you know, we're, we're, we're moving in that direction. But some of the other ones that are important for some of the, you know, the Lynch syndromes and the like. So I think that um, this is a space in which we really have to think very hard about utilizing this information for research purposes. And if you, you probably saw this paper at the end of last year from, from Sloan Kettering in their impact study where they were indeed doing this, doing primarily somatic sequencing, they could see things that looked very similar to what we saw in the pediatric uh, studies from St. Jude's and now we're, we're doing one to confirm that and several other groups are doing that, that some 10 to 15 percent of those individuals in their impact study, these are advanced cases that are getting targeted therapy for the, uh, they're getting sequencing to try and find targets that could then be, you know, they could bring known or investigational drugs to. 10 to 15 percent have CPG, or these cancer predisposition gene mutations. Not all of them are necessarily accepted as mutations to act on, but many of them, a high fraction, are very concerning. But interestingly enough, less than 50% match the disease that you expect. So BR, BRCA1 mutations with lung cancer, BRCA1 mutations with brain tumors, things that aren't part of our classical ascertained uh, pedigrees that we think about the, the likelihood that this cancer is caused by a particular mutation per se. And that's a mindset, I think, that as you go forward with in genomics England, you're going to be encountering this. And I think we have to really think very hard how we're going to use this information, reflecting it against what's in the literature out there. So it's a, it's a real challenge. I don't know how to solve it, but it's something that we're going to be, I think, hitting our heads against on a daily basis as our NGS machines go faster and faster. So I really think that the pushing the boundaries of genetic testing is what we have to think about, where our data generation is outstripping our data interpretation at this time. Genetic counselors are undergoing tr transformational role in the United States. You know, we're hoping that they're going to go from the Middle Ages to the Enlightenment period and then somewhere into the early 20th century very soon. I love genetic counselors, but it's a, it's a very formalized world that uh, I think is being shattered by the kinds of things that we see. And here's where in the United States it's a very unpopular notion shifting to the practitioner the discussion of this. This is something that would be very difficult as well in the UK, having the GP talk about these mutations. Uh, it, it, this is something that educationally now is difficult, but you have a young generation, 5, 10, 15 years from now, who are coming out of medical school and training who may be more amenable to this because they may be on 23andMe themselves figuring out that they're 19% Finnish and 27% West Scott and 27% and Northumberland or whatever that, you know, the recreational genomics is allowing people to do. And my biggest fear is that we academics will become Google consultants that will no longer work for St. Bart's or Harvard, but will work for Google, who will have these massive databases be trawling through and telling us that, well, why don't you interpret these particularly difficult ones for us, but we have the paradigms that can tell you the Ashkenazi mutations. And this really is going to be important to have the evidence-based recommendations on big data, which I'll come to at the very end. So I would say to end this part of the talk, we want, really have to explain susceptibility. I think if we were to stop doing our GWAS, if we were to stop doing our, our discovery, we would be doing ourselves a real disservice because I think we can see on the horizon real implications and use for these. And it really requires the forging of international collaborations to share data and understanding the environment and genetic modifiers. So this is where the epidemiologists really need to be part of this conversation. We've got the clinicians drawn into genomics, but we, what the epidemiologists are not as drawn in as I think they need to be to try and understand those etiologic questions that may be very important as we think of prevention. So the constancy of the genome. So after eight years of GWAS, we looked at 125,000 samples. We kept seeing these really odd chromosomes that we would throw out but we saw them with enough regularity. These are the germline that we said, hmm, there's something here. So we could see that there are copy neutral, there are mosaic gains, mosaic loss. And so we 
I think, gotten to this point that we can characterize very large, ugly, somatic alterations that are mosaic, that a fraction of circulating blood or buccal cells have these mosaic events, and they can be tolerated in the genome to a certain point. And the question is, are these harbingers of a cancer to come, or could these be just markers of the general senescence and the loss of stability of one's genome? But that in itself could be a risk for cancer. It may not be that you're getting the specific mutation that you see that somebody eventually develops for lung cancer or bladder cancer. But this is a question that we have to start to look at. And first, I think, really emerged from the GWAS. We knew that these old cases of age-old explanations, neurofibromatosis, trisomy 21, Turner syndrome, all the things that the medical students learn about mosaicism, you know, when you can look at the, you know, the calico cats, all those things are very clever, but it's in the population everywhere. So when we started looking at this, we could also see that there are highly penetrant mutations that lead to variegated aneuploidy. So the SEP57, I believe, Claire, that was your paper with, uh, with Naz, was a very beautiful paper showing a particular mutation that led these families to have these extraordinary aneuploidy that were within, that was inherited. And then we could also see the complex syndromes. And this is the scariest thing. The mutations that we see that we get excited about in tumors, you can see it in a fraction or part of the germline if you go to the skin or if you go to some other part of the body, whether it's Allier's disease or you see these individuals who have HRAS and KRAS mutations that are very ugly, including G12 and the like, which are very worrisome in normal skin, okay? So this raises the question of what, can, what do we tolerate and what is going on here? So as we started to look more closely, we pulled together about 120,000 genomes that we had scanned, germline, and you could see using the circos plot here that there are copy neutral events, that there are gains and losses using those SNP chips and very effectively doing this. And we've gone into the lab and confirmed a, subs a, a subsequent number of them to really look at this. And so we asked this question, how and why? There are places like chromosome 13, the same 13Q14 deletion you see in CLL. You see a small fraction of the population walking around with that very mutation. But doesn't necessarily mean that there were, everyone's going to go on to develop CLL, and it's not necessarily a harbinger of mugus per se. But it is an interesting question that needs to be looked at in prospective studies, chromosome 20 mutations as well. We see that these decrease with size, so we're seeing just sort of the tip of so, uh, side of the uh, artifact of the iceberg. We also see in our prospective studies where we had individuals that the fraction of mosaic cells increases in the blood with age. And these are from normal individuals that we see as much as 10 years apart, so they may have a higher fraction. And so as you get older, I'm sorry to say you're just not as good at deleting those somatic alterations that you really should be doing. You tolerate more. And I, you know, I think it, you know, there's a psychological and a, a psychiatric aspect that goes with that. It sort of parallels the, the aging process, per se. And we can clearly see that these events in, from GWAS increase with age quite dramatically. And if you go now look at single base mutations, the first couple of papers focused on hematologically interesting genes, again, you see the same age question of taking off, of seeing SNV, single nucleotide variant, um, somatic, mu uh, somatic mosaicism in all of the population. And interestingly enough, some of those studies were able to link them to cardiovascular outcomes as opposed to necessarily the risks for cancer. For cancer, we tried really hard to do this, and we had very large studies looking at all cancer or specific cancers. And for all cancers, there's a, a moderate signal, but I'm still very worried. And the frequentist that I am from the GWAS age, this is alluring, but it's going to take even larger numbers. To, no, just to ask the question, do the very large events portend for the likelihood of developing cancer? But when we look at the hematologic cancers, this is really astounding. So you could see, for instance, in the prospective cohorts, what you would expect in the red line there of the expected case of the expected cases of leukemia, but you can see the observed mosaic cases, particularly with 13Q14 deletion and the 20 uh, deletion that you often see in the myelogenous leukemia. So you see a much higher fraction of the population over a period of time are harboring these single mutations. Are these singular events that are truly pre-leukemic, or are they random on which the background of other events may then drive someone into the pre-leukemic or leukemic state. 
But when we've gone into our prospective cohorts, we've been able to see 13 Q14 deletion as much as 14 years before the diagnosis of CLL. So it does raise this question if we're going to be doing QOS and or sequencing in individuals of younger age, 20 to 40, what are we going to do with that information when we see these kinds of mosaics? That's a very important question in my mind. I, I don't know the answer, but we are going to see it. And I think when you do Genomics England and you sequence the younger individuals, you're going to be faced with these kinds of questions that you're going to have to be modeling to look carefully at. When we look at the rate of mosaicism by chromosomes, we can see the autosomes are pretty much constant in their background. The X is much higher, okay, and the Y is the highest. I'll save the Y for last for the men because it's the most depressing. I'll tell you the story of what goes on there. But the X is interesting, and we had noticed this, and there had been papers about somatic mutation rates being much higher in the inactive X. So we then went and looked at a subset of the women who we saw this, and we could see that their X chromosomes are inactive, the ones that in which the mosaicism is taking place by using the 450 methyl chip. But interestingly, about 10% of the mosaicism was affecting the active X, which is a real challenge to try and understand how that really is going on. And now, I was just in France, and there's some very interesting studies um, from the Curie really suggesting that lionization and activation and inactivation may be more facile between the chromosomes over the course of a woman's lifetime. Now, the Y chromosome is more common, and the Swedes had suggested that it was a consequence of aging and smoking, but also associated with cancer risk. We can't see that in studies that are seven to eight-fold larger and longer cohort observations. But you can see the age, 25 to 30 percent of men lose their Y chromosome or a mosaic for a large fraction of it tells us that it's probably not that important over time. I realize most of the women are smiling and saying, yes, we've already known that. When I showed my wife's not in science, she said, yeah, well, why did you have to spend all this money to show that? We've certainly known that. But what's interesting about the why is we then did a GWAS, and we could find a very interesting gene that's critical in hematopoietic malignancy translocations, and particularly the clicking together translocations, very strong hit. So the question is, are there parts of the genome that make you more or less susceptible to having mosaic events? And so with Y, we can clearly see that. So for genetic mosaicism, these clonal somatic events, we can clearly see all the chromosomes are affected. And there's a spectrum of events. It seems to be an inverse relationship between size and frequency. The timing is really the interesting hypothesis. Are these early events? They are below a certain threshold that with age, you then let them be uncapped, so to speak? Or are these because of errors in DNA repair and stability at a later age where you start to accumulate these and then some become actually set in the population? I have no idea. The mouse people have been trying to model this for years and argue vociferous, vociferously over this with no real clarity to that. So I think that the aging genome, the implications for cancer studies are important in thinking about germline because you can be fooled with the degree of mosaicism, the insights into genomics instability late and early events, and really, as I mentioned before, is this a matter of the event being specific for a cancer mutation or is this more likely that there are events that are telling us that you have a certain background events on which other stochastic somatic events may come and become drivers to drive a particular cancer. And that's a question that we really have to look at. So when we see this tip of this iceberg, how will we define that? And I think things like Genomics England are going to be incredibly important in looking at that next generation sequencing data, which has high enough coverage to really ask some of these questions. So really the last question I just wanted to touch on for two or three minutes, if that's all right, is the sharing of data. As you know, the Institute of Medicine had a report on precision medicine envisioned a knowledge network of disease. So the NCI has made a major commitment to develop a genomic data commons because we were so tired of hearing that the Broad called differently than the Sanger, than Wash U, than Baylor, San Francisco. I mean, it was really, it was like listening to the politicians talk about what they should do about turkeys at Christmas time. Just really, really frustrating. So we've put a fair amount of resources and are building something in the NCI that is the Genomic Data Commons, where we're putting all of the TCGA, moving the ICGC data, the target data, and all of our clinical sequencing that's NCI supported into one particular large uh, structure that's basically a cloud structure that would allow 
there to be singular calling with the same algorithm so that we can at least understand that and you may choose A, B, or C. Do you prefer the Broad or the Sanger or the Michigan or whatever? I mean, these are inside cricket, you know, these are very specialized differences, but they, there's a lot of belly who about them. But the, the be standardization of that information that as more information is added would potentially be brought to that. And that's something that I really wanted to put in front of uh, Genomics England is to how and in what way it may be wise to be interacting with this. Because at an international level, the only way we're really going to get to the bottom of this is to call all the genomes in the same way and say, we all agree BAM files have the following characteristics and we're going to use these metrics to try and understand what's going on. And so in, in our minds, this is very important and we've actually been very engaged with the Vice President's moonshot to talk about this data sharing and this notion of sort of the cancer information donor. As many Americans are paying their own dollars to have their, their genome sequenced and to move this information into this place and make this available. So I think that's really a, a, a crucial thing to, to go forward. So um, I think I'm going to skip the last couple of slides because I see I am one minute from 6.30 and I know we need a few questions before we go for drinks. I was going to talk about the BRCA challenge with Sir John Byrne, but I know Naz and others have spoken, I believe, in this forum about that. So let me just slip ahead. I really want to be sure I give thanks to all the wonderful people and particularly say something about, in my mind, there's a lot of excitement about precision medicine, which is the characterization of disease once it occurs or peri-occurrence. But I think, in essence, genomics may actually be even more powerful in the precision prevention. Because if we can understand what and how the susceptibility, for instance, to cancer or diabetes to heart disease and see that information at a much earlier time, we may be able to make substantial differences in the modifiable risks and change the face of many of the cancers that we see and or uh, potentially eliminate them. So I think that's a very important concept. So I'd like to particularly acknowledge Joe Fromaney and uh, Lou Stout, who have really been wonderful, and certainly Harold Varmus, who's not up there, but has been, was as the NCI director, extraordinarily supportive and, and thoughtful in thinking about how and in what ways to address this. So why don't I stop there and see if there are any questions. And thank you for your attention.